Hey everybody, welcome and thank you so much for tuning in to the Wayward Outreach Sermon. We really believe this sermon is going to bless you, so stick around and watch. Today, maybe you're in this room and it's so easy to just put things underneath the rug and not deal with it. We are not here to ignore our problems. We are here to deal with our problems. We are here to grow and we're here to say, God, speak to me so I can experience the life I should be living. You know, we're living in a really kind of messed up world. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of pain and suffering in this world. But I got good news. We can change. And this is the good news. We can also make an impact in the world that we're living in. How many believe we can make an impact in the world that we're living in? We're living in a world that's, that's really hurting. And we could ignore it. But right now while we're living in America, there's over 210 million orphans right now in the world. These are little boys and little girls that have no parents, and they don't even know where they're going to get their next meal from. That's happening in this world right now. Right now, right now there's over 22,000 kids that die. They, they die because today they're going to die. Today they're going to die because of, this is where they're going to die from, from poverty. Just interesting. It's, when you start thinking about this, man, this world is struggling. The United States right now spends over $200 billion dollars on, cor on the correctional system each year, a sum that exceeds the gross domestic product of 25 U.S. states and 140 foreign countries. We're spending more than 140 foreign countries on our incarceration system. And what that means is we got people that right now, somehow they were in, I want you to get this, they were slaves, they were bound, they were prisoners before they went to prison. Some of them were in prison, of, prison they were prisoners of anger, prisoners of violence, prisoners of a drug addiction, and now they're incarcerated, and we're spending over $200 billion a year for our correctional system. Right now, at least 10 times as many girls are now sex trafficked in brothels annually than we brought in, that, than Africans slaves were transported to the new world in the peak years of the transatlantic slave trade. Ten times the amount. I want you to get this. There's little girls right now that, are, that there's an adult looking at them and they're saying, this is perfect merchandise. But the worst thing about it, there's a demand for these little girls. They're, they're set up in brothels and grown men come in to take advantage of these little girls. We got some problems. And you might say, well, where is that happening? Well, the truth is, it's happening all over the world. It's happening in America. And most likely, it's happening with certain individuals in this church. Participating maybe in child pornography. And we're saying, well, I didn't hurt nobody. I'm looking at it. But understand, that's a little girl that was hurt. That's a little girl that was taken advantage of. Right now, over 74% of adults are dealing with some kind of addiction to alcohol or drugs. 74%. This is what it's saying. The majority of Americans are right now trying to numb themselves, acting like there's no problem. Well, yesterday, and I've realized this, that we're really, really good, I want you to get this, at ignoring issues. But I've known this, if we ignore them, you know what happens? They grow. They don't go away. It's like a cancer. It grows. Yesterday when I was eating lunch, there was a young lady that was a waitress, and she came up to me, and I have a habit. I do this a lot. I don't do it always, but I do this a lot. Um, before I pray, I let the waitress know. Her name was Yvonne. I go, Yvonne, um, we're getting ready to pray for our food. I would love to pray for you. Is there anything that you need? Well, you know, when I ask that question, the majority of people say this, I'm good. The majority of people, I want you to get that they're not saying good because they don't want prayer. They're saying good because they don't realize they got some serious problems. They're just ignoring them. And they're hoping they just go away. And maybe the problems are so big that we're just saying, it's better for me just to act like it's not there because to deal with it is too painful. We're really good at stuffing our emotions, stuffing our problems, and hiding. How many, how many get that? 
So this young lady tells me there's nothing wrong. I go, well, Sunday, uh, this Sunday, I'm going to be talking about overcoming depression. As soon as I said that, tears got in her eyes, and she goes, my husband is suffering from depression. I just asked her a minute before, is there anything you want prayer for? And she didn't realize when I said depression, she goes, I know someone that's struggling. And she knew her marriage is on the line. She knew her husband's life is on the line. There's a problem in her house. And the good news is Jesus can solve any problems that we have. The good news is we can change. Our society can change because we can bring change. How many believe that we can bring change? So now, people ask me all the time, say, Pastor Marco, if there's, if there's a God, why is there all this suffering you just mentioned? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much abuse going on? Why is there so much violence? Why, if there's a God? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you today. And maybe after this, you'll never ask that question again because you'll have the answer. Would you like to know what the answer is to all this pain, all this suffering, all this starvation, all these, all, all these orphans, all this addiction, all this depression? What's happening? This is the answer in Roman, Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. Now, at this time, Paul is the one who wrote the book of Romans. He's struggling with some religious people. These religious people think that they're self-righteous, that there's nothing wrong with them. They're religious people. And they thought they were better than the masses. They thought they were better than the pagans. They thought they were better than the non-Jews. They thought they were better than the Gentiles. And then Paul opens the scripture up and he says, there's a problem. And this is the problem that every single human is dealing with, and what he was saying is, we're all in the same boat. Say it with me. We're all in the same boat. You know what that means? Is all of us have issues, all of us struggle, and all of us need a Savior that can help us through our struggles, out of our struggles, and help us overcome. That's the reality. So when I say these stats, we fit in somewhere. But the truth is, the reason there's so much pain and there's so much suffering is in that scripture. All people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are all under the power of sin. So what's the problem? The problem is that we're under a power of error, under a force, an influence that brings selfishness, destruction, and pain and suffering and misery everywhere it's ruling. Under the power, this is what it means. Place beneath, it means subject to its authority it means, or, or direction or subject to the influence or condition or force or control by. Just think about this. We have a problem because we're controlled by sin. Who, who in this world is controlled by sin or is born controlled by sin? Every single human being. And this is why we say this at times, I'll never do that again, and you find yourself doing it. And that's why our New Year's resolutions don't work. And that's why the husband, after he goes on a, he goes on a run all weekend long and he abuses his wife, comes back and he says, honey, on Monday, I'll never do it again. But he finds himself doing it again. Why would he do it again? Because he's under the power of sin. How many times have people promised you something and they, it looks like they meant it with all their heart, but they fell through because they're under the power of sin. There's some things right now that we can't overcome Without, I want you to get, we can't, we can't overcome without the power of Jesus setting us free. The biggest problem we have in the universe right now is the power of sin. That's why an addict says, I'll stop, but he can't. We try to calm down our anger, but somehow we can't. We try to be faithful, but then we can't. What's the reason? We're under 
the power of sin. I got good news that we don't have to be under this power anymore. The word sin means this. It means to miss the mark. It means to wander from the path of uprightness and honor. It means to go or go wrong. It means to wander from the law of God, violate God's law. So this is what the scripture is saying. The biggest problem we have in this world is that people are under the power of sin. And, and I want you to get this. And until we address that, people don't even know they need freedom. Because if we're under, let me say, if, if we're influenced by the power of sin, if we're being controlled by this power, by these desires, by this fleshly pursuit of pleasure, and we're being controlled by it, how do we get set free? Is it willpower? You don't have enough willpower. I've learned this. You could use your willpower all day long. All you do is drop one sin and pick up another. Have you ever done that? You drop the weed and you pick up cocaine. I mean, it just doesn't change. You drop boo-boo and you pick up Samuel. It doesn't matter. Same old sin, just a different face. Isn't that right? You can move from a city. I'm going to get away from the sin. You can't get away from the sin because the sin lies in you. There's only one person that can set you free from the power of sin, and his name is Jesus. He's the only one that can cause us to change. We can change. But it's not in our willpower. It's in God's power. Change can happen. Your emotions can change. Your desires can change. Your heart can change. Your will can change. Your ability can change with the power of God. So we have a problem. We've wandered away from the path, but this power holds us. So what are the qualities of someone that's under the power of sin? In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it begins to explain it. It says this, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is righteous, not even who? You know what it's saying here? We all have strayed away from God. And it doesn't matter how great we try to cover it up, or it really doesn't matter how many works of righteousness we've done. The truth is, none of us in this room are in a condition apart from Jesus that can be acceptable to God or approved by God to get into heaven or considered righteous. That's the problem. Problems is the problem. He says, none of us. Who? Not even one. Righteous means, this is what it means. It means use of him who is, whose way of thinking, feeling, and acting is holy. It means one who's conformed to the will of God. One who therefore needs no re rectification in, his, in the heart or life. Approved or acceptable by God. I want you to get this. No one apart from Jesus, no one that's separated from Jesus, is righteous on their own. You guys get that? No one can be approved by any works that we do. You guys get that? So let's think about this. Now, why is that so important? Because the first step to getting right is acknowledging that we're not right. The first step to getting right is to acknowledge this, this, we ain't right. I got a little ghetto right there. We ain't right. See, if we don't watch it, when we get, I want you to, when we get confronted that we are not right, we ain't right, this is what could happen. Either we accept that, yeah, I ain't right. I, got, I, I know, I, I know I ain't right. Right? Or we could defend Defend ourselves and become, I want you to guess, try to be self-righteous. Because when we could get confronted with our condition, either we defend it or we just say, you know what, I need to change. And if, if, if when you're in church, there's times that subjects are brought up and you get offended, I want you to get this. There's something rising up and you got to ask yourself, why am I getting offended? What in me is not right that's trying to hide right now and is trying to justify itself? Something's not right. You know what's so good about this? We don't have to stay in that condition. Now, the first step to getting right is acknowledging that we're not what? We will never change or ask for help, be saved, until we humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness. I'm going to read you a story in Luke chapter 8 verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. There was a man, there was Jesus telling a story, and he's speaking to religious people. 
I would say this, he's speaking to some church people. And the, the, the thing about, let's say you grew up in the church, you might think because you grew up in the church that you are just right because of your affiliation. I'm affiliated. Or, or you might think you're right, like my daughters, I got five girls. They might think they're right because their daddy's a pastor. But the truth is, they got to stand before God on their own, and without Jesus, they ain't right. Remember, they, they're not right. Now, there was a, a Pharisee or a, a religious leader, or you would call him a priest in those days, and he went into the church to pray. But while he went into the church to pray, there was another guy that knew he was a sinner, and he went in to pray. Two guys going to pray. Jesus is sharing a story. Look at this story. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So he's speaking to a group of people that have great confidence. Where's their confidence? In their own what? Righteousness. Where's their confidence? In their own righteousness, okay? In their own righteousness. They have great confidence. They don't have great confidence in God. They have great confidence in their own righteousness, okay? So that's where the confidence is at. And scorned everyone else because I've learned this. When we think we're all that, we start putting down everybody else. So Jesus is now dealing with these people that have great confidence in their own righteousness. And this is the worst part. Now they're, this is what they're doing. They're scorning everybody else. Like everybody else is just so low compared to us. Now the problem Jesus is having, he cannot reach these people until they realize they're just like everybody else. They're not righteous. And they need a Savior. So now Jesus is telling the story to right now maybe get... You know what he's trying to do? Wake them up. He's trying to give them some shock treatment. That's what he's trying to do. He's confronting, he's confronting them. I want you to get this. There's a time in our lives that we got to confront people and let them know the, the place that they're in so they can get saved, delivered, and set free. That young lady that I met at the hospital, that she was my nurse, I confronted her, and I began to show her that she's not righteous, and she needs a Savior, and religion can't save her. You know what she did? Two minutes later, three minutes later, she said this, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to be saved. How do I do this? I go, honey, let's pray right now. And we pray. I got my checkup, but she got salvation. She got eternal life. And she said, thank you. I didn't know my condition. That is so good. So now, two men, he's telling a story to these religious guys that have confidence in themselves. Two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. Back in those days, a tax collector was like the bottom of the barrel. Like if someone told you like this, you're a tax collector, you said, what? You better not call me no tax collector, homie. Your mama's a tax collector. Oh, no, she ain't. <laughs> so, like, these were fighting words. Like, don't call me. A, because they were considered, be, they were considered low lives. They were considered betrayed. They were betraying their own race. They were considered thieves. They were considered liars. They were considered greedy. Don't, they, so, these two people go into the church. I want you, a priest goes in, went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other one was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself. Look at his prayer. And prayed. This is an awesome prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, and adulterers. <laughs> Imagine that prayer. His prayer is, I want to thank you. I'm not like the other people. I'm certainly, and I want you to get this. He's an exclamation point. He goes, I certainly not like that tax collector. So imagine they're both praying, and this guy just starts screaming. And I thank you, Lord. I'm not like that tax collector. Basically what he was doing is that tax collector has no right to be in here. What is he doing in the temple? He's not righteous, and I'm going to tell him to his face even in my prayer. Wow. Let's be careful that we don't become like a, like a Pharisee in the church. 
that we forget where we came from and we forget that we should welcome every single person that's hurting and broken and broken and give them the love of God. Who are you to judge when you got old logs coming out of your own eye and you're trying to take a speck out of somebody else's eye? You know what God is saying? Bring those sinners into my house because at least they know that they're sinners and I could save someone that recognizes that they're not righteous. So he prays and he, say, he goes on to say, I fast twice a week. His prayer is not over. And I give you a tenth of my income. I tithe too. Ooh, what a prayer this is. I do this, I do that, I do that, I do that, and I just thank you. I'm not like that person that does all that wrong. Thank you. I just want to thank you for who I am. I want to thank you that I'm God's gift to the world. I just want to thank you. I'm so good, and he's not so good. Now, th this is a big, big problem. I'll tell you why it's a big, big problem big problem because his salvation is at stake. He's doing religious things and he's still going to hell because he does not recognize that he is not righteous and the only one that can make him righteous is Jesus by forgiving him and setting him free and giving him the gift of righteousness. He's still under the power of sin. But the tax collector, he prays too. He stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, and I want you to get this, this is after the insult. Like, some of us, our anger would have took over. Like, who do you think you are? You wish you were like me. You wish you were like me. You know how much money I got? Stealing from you, stupid. You understand how humans are. But he was, I want you to guess, he wouldn't even dare lift his eyes. You know what he felt? I'm not even worthy to be here praying to you. And look what he says. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I'm messed up. I've walked away from you. I've practiced sin. I've violated your law. Forgive me. Have mercy. I don't deserve for you to hear me. I'm asking for mercy. God, forgive me. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The problem with the Pharisee, his faith was, his, was in his own works. He was comparing himself with a man, and he wasn't comparing himself to God. See, the comparison is not you and your neighbor. Your comparison is you and God. And that's the problem. When you compare yourself with God, you fall short. And you know what that means? There's nothing that me and you can do to make up for our sin. We could only be forgiven and realize it was a price to pay for the gap. He paid the debt. Jesus died for our sins. We did the crime. He did the time. We did, we did the crime. He suffered for it. He was punished for it to give us a free gift of righteousness, a free gift of eternal life. Salvation cannot be earned. Salvation can only be received by faith and grace. This is what we're talking about. Let's make sure that our faith is in Jesus. Us, not our faith in our own works. Now, why is that so important? Because when you first came to Jesus, this is cool, you knew you were jacked up. Right? Because when people presented Jesus to you, when you thought you had everything together, you said, that's good for you, not for me. Have you ever been in that position? Like, yeah, you I don't, matter of fact, when we're, like, we think we got it together and we're in denial, this is what we do, like, don't preach to me. Why are you preaching to me for? Did I ask for your opinion? But when your world falls apart, and then you're getting consequences for your bad choices, emotionally, relationally, you're starting to realize your life is getting out of control. Sin, the power of sin has taken over. Sin is so deceptive because they'll let you think you got control of it. 
I'll never become an addict. I'll never become abused. I'll never get, get caught up in a self-destructive lifestyle. I'll never be depressed. I'll never have anxiety. I, that will never happen to me. I got control. But there's a time where the tables are flipped and the master takes over. He was always the master. He was just getting you addicted. He was just making sure you were, uh, making sure that you were became a slave to your condition. And then the tables turn and you start realizing, man, I'm in a mess. And you tried the drugs, you tried the friends, you tried the girlfriends, you tried the boyfriends, you tried everything you could try, and you, found, you tried the clubs, you tried the dressing, you tried the money, you tried the new purse, you tried the new nails, you tried the new hairdo, you tried working out, you tried everything. But after you did it all, there was still something missing in your heart, and you said, man, I can't fix this. And then finally, someone said, why don't you come to the way? And you go, I need some help. I don't know what the solution is. And then you heard a message like this. You heard a solution. And then you raise your hand. It says, save me. I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. As soon as you cried out, I want you to get this, church. He saved you. And he forgave you. The scripture says, the tax collector went away. Justified, yeah, yeah. forgiven, and saved. Yeah. And that Pharisee, if he never changes prayer, today he's in hell for eternity. And he thought he was righteous. His faith was in himself. His faith was in his religion. His faith wasn't in a savior. I deal with this all the time. People that think they're okay. Just like this Pharisee. And either you're, I want you to guess, you're either in one category or the other. You think you're okay, or you realize I'm a sinner. <laughs> and if you realize you're a sinner, I got good news for you. You can change. You can be saved. You can become a brand new person because you'll never get right until you start realizing I'm right. As a Christian, be careful that you didn't start out recognizing you're messed up. And after now you got a few years underneath your belt, and now you start searching your confidence, not, from, uh, not to Jesus, now it's on you. Like you're the professional Christian. I'm so glad I'm not like those new Christians. And how do you know you're getting infected by that self-righteousness? You start judging other Christians like it's your job. That's why when I'm on the pulpit here, I don't really talk, I don't talk about other churches. It's not my business. I don't talk about other leaders. It's not my business. My responsibility is to make sure that I'm living right, that I'm serving God, that I'm pleasing God. My, I understand this. If it's not for the mercy of God, who am I going to judge? I got issues still. Is there anybody else that has some issues still? Even though you're saved, but you realize, man, there's still sin lurking. It just keeps popping up, that ugly little monster. What, what? Isn't that right? I know we dress good when we come to church. We got our makeup all together. We're driving our car with our little worship music. We got the Way We're Lowry sticker, brand new t-shirt. Hey, Kev, I thought I'm a Christian. But we know this. There's still another side of you, which is, come on, it's your sin nature, and that thing is still lurking, and until you get to heaven, you're going to have to, come on, you're going to have to crucify that thing, acknowledge it, repent from it, and come on, I want you to get this, and it keeps you, I'll get this, it keeps you humble. Yeah. Pastor, are you humble? I'm humble by my own lifestyle. You guys understand that? I, once, in, once in a while my anger pops up and I go, what's that? <laughs> once in a while I'll start getting depressing thoughts. I'm like, what's that? I'm not supposed to be experiencing this worry and this anxiety and this depression and uneasiness within me. What, 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 what's that? I'm, I'm going to get that. Some of you guys, when a girl passes by, I'm not saying me, you. <laughs> and you start looking, dead, what's that? Okay? <laughs> 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 
right? There, there are times that, that you're ready to say something and something slips out. And you go, what, what's that? That's not something you said in church on Wednesday. I, I want you to get this. We are not putting cosign on our sin. We're just recognizing this. Let's not get to the point that we're self-righteous because it doesn't matter how righteous you are. You, come on, you cannot earn heaven. You cannot earn God's mercy. You cannot earn forgiveness. You cannot earn eternal life. You can't. Hmm. Oh, I want you to get this. All that place, their confidence in their own righteousness will not be saved. So if I ask you a question, if today you die and you stand before God and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to say? If you say this, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I serve in a ministry. I walk old ladies across the street. This is what I'm going to tell you. You will go to hell. Because by the confession of your own mouth, you, you said, my faith is in me, not in you, Jesus. Now, I'm going to get to heaven. And, and I'm not going to get to heaven because I'm a pastor of the Way Royal Outreach. Imagine me standing before God. Why should I let you in heaven? Well, I'm a pastor of the Way Saving thousands of people. <laughs> I gave towards the building fund a lot of money. If I say that, I want you to get this. I could be preaching and be a Pharisee and still go to hell. Because I would be dependent on my own righteousness. This must be a lesson that we learn. Because if your faith is not in Jesus, your faith is now in yourself. And I want you to get this. You are not the Savior. Your name is not Jesus. Maybe it is Jesus, but you're not Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, my name is Jesus. Not, I know, but, but not Jesus Christ. You're not the Messiah or the Savior. You got that right. Titus 3.5, it says this. He saved us. Who saved us? Jesus. Because... Of his mercy, we didn't earn it. Not because of any good things we did. He saved us through the washing that made us new people. He saved us by making us new through the Holy Spirit. It was a miracle. He forgave us and gave us a new life through the power of his spirit. This is not an act of man. It's an act of God. I didn't save me. Jesus saved me through the power of his spirit. I'll just drive this home, just one more point. Apart from God, our own righteousness are filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of us are dirty with sin. We're born that way. We're born sinners. I'm not surprised that my kids have lied to me. I'm almost surprised when they tell me the truth. When they're kids. Because they're born sinners. I'm not surprised when a man tells me he's struggling with pornography or lust issues. That don't surprise me because he's born in sin. I'm not surprised when a woman tells me that she has a boyfriend, she's living with him, sleeping with him and with no commitment. She's just looking to be loved and looking to fit in and she's a sinner. She's trying to fix it. I'm not surprised. I'm not even surprised when I hear, and I hear it at the altar all the time, I was abused when I was a little girl. Because I, I want you to get this. I am not justifying it. But I understand that people are under the power of sin. And it's so destructive. And that's why Jesus died for sin. Sin is ugly and sin is is dirty. And I want you to get this. Let's stop having pet sins and acting like it's okay. Jesus died for our sins. Let's not play with them. But look, he says this. All of us are dirty with sin. 
all the right things we have done are like filthy pieces of cloth. All of us are like dead leaves. Like the wind, our sins have carried us away. Dead leaves. You know what I'm saying? The wind comes, and the leaf can't say, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> Where the wind takes the leaf, the leaf goes. And what it's saying here, without Jesus in our lives, we're a dead leaf. Where the power of sin takes us, we go. And we go places we never thought we would go. We go, God, what you get? We go into darker places than we ever thought we would go. We go deeper in it than we ever thought we would go. It goes farther than we ever thought because the power of sin has taken us. So when I come before God, I can't come with my dirty rags and say, this is why I should get to heaven. But I got good news for you. Jesus died for every single thing we've ever done. He took our sin on the cross and he was punished. So you and I no longer need to live under the power of sin. Jesus said this, who the sun sets free is free indeed. You're no longer a dead leaf. When you give your life to Jesus, you become an alive son and daughter of God with God's spirit in you that gives you the power to live a life that you couldn't live. And then God gives you his own righteousness. You know what that means? When I stand before God, my life is hidden in Christ. When I stand before God and they check my DNA, they're not going to see my blood. They're going to see the blood of Jesus, sinless blood, perfect blood, his righteousness represent me. My life is hidden in his blood. I love that. They checked my blood. It's all Jesus. Let him in. And I can hear the devil say, yeah, 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 but... You know, the other day, he was mad at his wife. He was acting like a fool. And then Jesus is going to say, it's under the blood. It's my blood that makes him righteous. It, he's not saved by his works. He is saved by my blood. It's my blood that makes him righteous. It's my blood that cleanses him. It's my blood that qualifies him for eternal life. And that's why we worship him on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday morning. Because if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, I'm nothing but a filthy rag before God with no hope of new beginnings, with no hope of salvation, with no hope of becoming someone new. I can change because of what Jesus did for me. There was a day I cried to Jesus and said, Jesus... I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Save me. And all Jesus did, he said, son, I was just waiting for that. I've been looking at you before you were born. Daughter, I've been looking at you and all your pain and suffering. You've been all alone and I've been waiting for you just to give me that prayer and I'm coming in now and I'm forgiving you and I'm setting you free and I'm giving you a new life and now you're gonna be able to be everything God called you to be. That's the good news. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. Now join me for a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for today's word. We pray that it would touch our heart and we would learn how to apply it this week. Continue to go with us this week and encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to walk with you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again. And, and if you'd like to partner with us by supporting the ministry, simply click the link in the bio or the description. Thanks again, and we'll see you.